What's up, motherfuckers? I am here today to talk about what I always talk about, which is, of course, the crisis of infant circumcision in American society. I'm going to begin this video with two opening statements. One, this is not a bit. I'm not joking. I'm, de I'm so dead serious. Second of all, I think most people I've spoken to on this issue can agree with me that circumcision isn't ultimately a positive in our society, but they don't see it as something that is harmful or they don't see it as something worthy of the, for the forefront of cultural discussions and something that they would like to speak about with other people. <laughs> and I think both of these sentiments come from the same place, circumcision being a taboo, which is very ironic considering how commonplace it is in American society. So as noted by many pediatricians and circumcision researchers, including the prominent Robert Van Howe, who's an American pediatrician and circumcision researcher who served as the chief of pediatrics at Central Michigan University, infant male circumcision is the most common surgery in America, and it's predominantly performed on infants within their first three days of life. Okay, I'm gonna take my glasses off because I have notes and I cannot see a thing in these, but I'd like to further discuss the circumcision taboo, and I'd like to reframe this issue because I believe it to be a bodily autonomy and children's rights issue, as well as a feminist issue because clearly it's disproportionately affecting one part of the population. I mean, I'm wearing this shirt today, yes, to be provocative, to provoke you to think about the fact that women do have foreskins as well, yet it's a felony to cut ours, and there are 500,000 to 1 million circumcisions being performed annually in the United States, 80% of the male population being circumcised. I'd like to take this opportunity to say as well that I am not anti-circumcision. I am anti-medically unnecessary surgeries being performed on the unconsenting, which I think is something we can all get behind. But why is circumcision so widely performed in the United States? The American Academy of Pediatrics confirmed in 1971 that there are no medically valid justifications for routine circumcision. And despite pushback from the members, they reaffirmed their stance in 1999, maintaining they don't recommend circumcision. <sighs> Following suit in 2000, the American Medical Association also concurred that routine circumcision was non-therapeutic. So I'd like to read this quote from Alex Straker, who works in the Clinical Medical Humanities and Bioethics Department at Fungi School of Medicine. No one seriously thinks that the health benefits are the reason to circumcise infants. This is latched onto by those who are looking for a reason to justify a pre-existing desire to circumcise baby boys. It appears that the majority of circumcisions in the United States are not performed on a medical basis, at least not a well-informed and good faith medical basis. So what faith is driving these circumcisions? The Abrahamic ones? Let's see. Let's for a second just accept that Abrahamic religions unequivocally support and even call for circumcision. And let's for a moment accept that we are in moral, ethical, and logical agreement with religious ceremonies using the bodies of infants and permanently altering them. Let's say that we are fine with this. 63% of the US population is Christian. Less than 3% of the US population is Jewish. About 1% of the US population is Muslim. This adds up to 67%, yeah? The percentage of American men who are circumcised adds up to what? 80%. So even by the most conservative of estimates, this leaves 10% of circumcisions performed in the US with no medical and no religious justifications. This translates to 50 to 100,000 dicks being chopped yearly. To put it in perspective for my Bible heads out there, this is enough Philistine foreskin for the dowry of 500 Princess Mihas. Let's talk about the social prevalence of circumcision. Ryan McAllister of Georgetown University gave a great lecture in 2011 called Elephant in the Hospital, where he discussed circumcision as just that, an elephant in the room, widely practiced that nobody wants to actually discuss. And he talks about the cyclical nature of circumcision being performed to make kids look like their fathers, being performed because it's something everyone does without further analysis. So McAllister points out in this lecture that circumcision is the only surgery that removes a healthy organ part with the exception of intersex genital modification. And this is only justified through social reasons. 
to make the body like the family members, to make it look like their peers. And it's an aesthetic procedure. It's cosmetic. The most popular procedure in American surgery is a cosmetic procedure performed on infants. Okay, now let's drop the acceptance of religious justifications for bodily modification of infants because that's insane, first of all. And second of all, it's not really the reason most people are circumcising their children. What accepted view of children in our society allows for this? I believe that it's the view that children are not full people and they're not deserving of the full spectrum of human rights as everyone else is allocated. I think people see children as an extension of their parents. So from the people I've spoken to, I feel that this view of children is incredibly common and not questioned in American society at all. I think this attitude comes from the isolation of the nuclear family from larger communities under American family structure, American economic structure. And it's the exact environment that fosters the inability to speak on these issues. The fact that these are taboos and not spoken about. There's not a larger community to question and maintain family relations. Children are seen as the property of their parents. And this fosters not only a community where these things aren't discussed, but it allows things like interfamilial abuse to go unnoticed. So if you watch the documentary American Circumcision, it has a lot of information on this topic, but it also gives a lot of personal accounts and emotional appeals, if that's your thing. And one case I found relevant was the case of Derek Weber, just a circumcised individual talking about the dissolution of his relationship with his mother. And he cited the discussion he had with her about the decision to circumcise him as a point of contention in their relationship, which they were not able to get past. And she explained it was the choice which came down to parental preference. And ultimately her reasoning was a cosmetic reason. And the final quote he gave from her, which I felt reflected this larger attitude was, you are mine. So I don't think my personal position on this issue can be better summed up than this quote from Peterson in 2001, which is no person has the right to surgically inflict their religious, sexual, or cosmetic preference on another person. Parents have a duty to protect their children from harmful practices and no tradition should be enforced by the permanent alteration or disfigurement of the body of an individual who is legally incapable of providing informed consent. I'd like to also take this opportunity to point out that when circumcision became commonplace in the States, it was not a medical or practical reason. It was the enforcement of Victorian morality onto the bodies of infants as a cure for masturbation. In his lecture, Ryan McAllister makes the argument that circumcision is harmful not only to the men it's performed on, the children it's performed on, but to the parents and medical professionals who are enacting this decision. If we operate in good faith and assume that everyone else does the same, parents want the best for their children, and those in the medical field do want the best for their patients, among other things, and they're being forced to operate in opposition to their morals from lack of knowledge, from procedure, from requirements. Another case I found notable from American Circumcision was that of Marilyn Milos, who was a nurse, and in 1985, she was fired for disclosing that the procedure was painful and unnecessary before a parent signed off on it. The majority of the time, it's the mother being asked if she would like to circumcise her baby because, of course, the mother is the one who is always present at the time of birth. And the majority of obstetricians and nurses are females. Many make the claim that it contributes to the way we see men's bodies as things that should be stronger or even more expendable. And I do believe circumcision is a feminist issue. It's one that is primarily enabled by women. It's probably one of the only feminist issues that affects American society at such a large scale that is predominantly women carrying out harm towards men, at least on this physical <laughs> realm, right? I don't think anyone is solely responsible, but I want to acknowledge women's role because I believe it's a social issue and in social issues, we should examine our own place and how we contribute and reproduce these, in my opinion, injustices. 
I feel the need to make the point because I do feel women should examine our role in this larger issue. A book that deeply affected me was Why Does He Do That? by Lundy Bancroft, where he examines domestic violence as a men's issue instead of the typical framing of domestic violence as a women's issue because he aims to empathize and understand the psychology of those who were typically the perpetrators. So in that, I aim to examine the female perspective on circumcision. And I believe most mothers agree to circumcision being performed because they believe it is more hygienic, which we can look into further. They believe it's medically recommended, which has been disproven and will be further disproved, and is more aesthetic. If you're familiar with the concept of attachment theory, it's not a far logical leap to connect the experience of being circumcised as an infant to a greater mental trauma, greater mental attitudes being held by men in our society and even women in our society. So many make the claim that circumcision is justified as the infants will not remember the pain. And first of all, I'd like to make the point that people used to say that infants couldn't even feel pain, which we know is not true. I have in my personal life talked about this issue with friends and they said that, oh, you know, my sister's baby was circumcised and he didn't even cry. And to that I say, I don't care, first of all. It doesn't matter, even if they feel nothing. I think it's an in, intrusion on their body. It's an ethical issue, no matter if they feel or don't feel the pain. I'd like to not go into discussing the actual physical procedure too much because first of all, it's not really my area of interest and second of all, it's quite sickening. But I'd like to point out that it's not just removal of skin, it's the sealing of that skin where it has been removed which is intense pressure on the dick of a newborn, which I imagine to be pretty sensitive. Just something to think about. Second of all, infants can feel pain. And according to Tadio, in a study on pain response and memory in children, they can remember pain as well. While looking at the neonatal circumcision and pain response of 87 infants, circumcised infants demonstrated an increased pain response to routine vaccinations measured through physical reactions and time spent reacting. So an example of a court case which ended up ruling in favor of greater information on circumcision is that of William Stowell and David Lewin, who is a medical malpractice lawyer, against a hospital which performed Stowell's circumcision. His mother had expressed some disinterest in opting into the procedure and was asked early in the morning directly post cesarean while still under the influence of Demerol in the hospital, which just goes to show how casually this is brought up. And this is mentioned in the lecture, which I constantly cite, um, Elephant in the Hospital, where it is treated as a very casual thing leading patients and parents to not consider the more grave, the more serious aspects of the procedure. She was presented early in the morning post cesarean while still under the influence of drugs. And the hospital ended up settling on the way to trial for medical mal, sorry. The hospital ended up settling on the way to trial for medical malpractice and battery. So, you're welcome if you can hear my roommate um, doing the background music. Let's hope that doesn't get flagged and it's an original and not cover, which I will also include a link to her original song in the bio. Um, okay, but anyway, according to Gregory J. Boyle, who wrote about circumcision of infants and children, I will also link his article. Aside from the obvious physical harm of the surgery itself removing healthy tissue, it can lead to excess bleeding, which I'd like to point out, infants only have about 12 ounces of blood and one ounce is a major loss of blood. It can also lead to infections and excessive removal, which is actually very common in these procedures, which furthers a point that many of this era are unwilling to accept, that circumcision removes healthy tissue 
which holds value in the reception of feeling, you know? So for Eric.com actually did interviews with circumcised men and found that those who were more comfortable with the fact that they were circumcised estimated that the adult foreskin was much smaller than it actually is. And as furthered by Ryan McAllister in his lecture, it's the most erogenous tissue in males, obviously. Adult foreskins can measure 12 to 15 square inches and have 10 to 20,000 nerve endings. Male con contribution to the mechanical lubrication during intercourse is aided by the foreskin. So Sorrels and all, at all, you know, 2007 did a touch sensitivity test and found it was much higher in intact males, obviously. So I'm sure any reasonable person is thinking, if it's not a medical necessity, then why are hospitals continuing to enact the procedure and offering it without giving a full account for informed consent of their patients and of the parents of their patients? And to that I say, let's examine the economic aspect. So let's examine this from an economic standpoint. Not only are parents being asked to pay for the procedure of circumcision on their child, which I feel is somewhat coercive because if a medical institute is offering to circumcise your child, you will probably assume that there are medical benefits to circumcision, which is not a completely informed place. Not only are your parents paying for this to be done to you, but did you know that hospitals actually profit off of the commercial use of foreskin harvested during these processes? Let's talk about these products. So the first being Invitrogen, product code CO205C, look it up, human epidermal keratinites. Hope I said that wrong. I'd like to point out in the description of all of these products, it's listed as neonatal single donor. In my opinion, a neonatal cannot be a donor. So, product one, human epidermal keratinites. So skin cells protecting from microbial invasion, which shield UV exposure and maintain skin hydration through keratin. Again, collected from the dick of an infant. And I'd like to point out in this description, they felt the need to specify it was an environment free of animal derived components. So just so you know, you're not hurting any animals in the process. And you can buy this for $782 Canadian or $582 USD per vial. All right, let's talk about COO45C human dermal fibroblasts. Neonatal fibroblasts supports and connects to tissue and organs in the body type of cell which secretes collagen proteins. This can be obtained for $810 Canadian or $591 USD per vial. And let's think about where this money is going back to. Do you think they um, give that to the parents of the donor? Do you think they give that to the donor? No, obviously fucking not. It's pocketed. Um, human epidermal melatonites, neonatal, darkly pigmented melatonites, produce melanin, 884 CAD or 644.77 USD. So I'd like to point out in the interest of intersectional intactivism that these human epidermal melatonites are harvested from those who are darkly pigmented. So I think it's worth examining if circumcision is more highly encouraged amongst the darker infants, a process which we now know is medically unnecessary and can actually be medically harmful to harvest these human epidermal melatonites, neonatal, darkly pigmented, 644.77 USD. I want to scream right now. like. And if you don't believe me or you want to buy it, please don't buy it. The product code for that one is C2025C. I think it's worth looking into. And we can in the next video, but I think I have reached my limit for today. And I'd like to give some closing statements before I end this. 
So oftentimes I will discuss this issue with someone and they'll bring up the point that a lot of people would pierce their infant's ears and they can't remember it or they don't care later on and ask me if I'm also against piercing infant's ears. Yeah, on the same principle, I wouldn't pierce my own child's ear. I don't think you really do have the right based on purely cosmetic reasons, but I don't think it's as much of an infraction as circumcision of an infant when, when medically unnecessary. And two things I want to bring up are the cosmetic dentist industry in the United States. Enough said. And the medication of children, which I think maybe deserves more of a forefront. But I don't know if I'm ready to go up against Big Pharma on my little YouTube channel. Um, yeah, no, if your child is medicated for like ADHD or depression, like you need to be shot. And the final thing I feel the need to say is I would be remiss discussing children's rights right now, including children's rights not to be used as a political pawn or in warfare. And I am also going to link support for the children in Gaza and for Friends of the Congo. There are so many children dying and their lives being ruined right now due to these genocides and on that note i really hope you have a good day i hope i was somewhat lucid in this video this is honestly probably my most lucid video i mean i ate something today and i'm not drunk so i definitely have a leg up on my <laughs> most of my um recent youtube videos okay um